Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, welcome to uh, our weekly uh, Facebook uh, Live or uh, Instagram Live. And um, hope everybody survived the snow. We were here. Uh, Hopkins was basically sort of closed yesterday. That means all the people who earned the big salaries were off, and the rest of us, the docs, the techs, the nurses, were all working. A lot of our patients made it in, and today all the snow is melting. So life goes on. And so my job today is to speak to you a little bit about mimickers of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. I thought it would be a good talk, and actually I'm working on a paper on, or a lecture, which we'll eventually have on CTSS. And um, one of the challenges, of course, I noticed this when we do all the pancreas conferences, is that many patients are referred in for pancreatic cancer, and you know most of them do have pancreatic adenocarcinomas. Some have, adeno some have neuroendocrine tumors or acid or cell tumors. But often there are many cases where there are mistakes in the diagnosis. Now, what happens is sometimes actually we see mistakes when the biopsy is incorrect or read correctly initially. That happens 3% of the time. But other times people are sent in for what they suspect is a pancreatic mass, and it isn't. So let me go through some of the things that I think can be confusing and things you can think about and things that perhaps might help you in making the right diagnosis. So when I look at things and say, well, what things can simulate uh, pancreatic masses? Now, I guess I should first say that if you have a poor quality study and the patient is breathing and is motion, or even if the patient isn't moving but the bowel isn't distended, or if you don't have a lot of experience, you could overcall the presence of a mass. Things look full and you do, the world famous cannot rule out a mass. Well, hopefully you're not doing that. But where I see mistakes happen is where there is something there, but you're considering it the wrong thing. So one possibility is that the patient indeed has a pancreatic mass, but it's not an adenocarcinoma. Now, sometimes patients can have things like acid or cell tumors, and that's hard to say, uh, though we're getting better at thinking about that. But neuroendocrine tumors might be one of the things you think about. Neuroendocrine tumors, particularly if you didn't do arterial phase imaging, Though also sometimes patients with neuroendocrine tumors have tumors that are relatively denser than the typical adenocea, but not hypervascular. Remember, most neuroendocrine tumors are hypervascular. I think things that help me are that adenocarcinoma is typically always low density. It's not soft tissue density, it's lower density. When you see neuroendocrine tumors that are unvascular, or you see neuroendocrine tumors that are vascular, but you only have late phase imaging, they seem to be more solid than your typical adenocarcinoma. That comes with a little bit, little bit of experience to recognize that, but just something to keep in mind. One of the things also I like to think about is when I see pancreatic adenocarcinoma, unless it's off the peripheral tail or it's coming off the uncinate, I always like to see some type of duct dilatation. There's a mass in the head of the pancreas. Usually I see common duct and pancreatic duct. Not always, because sometimes the mass is not strategically located for that to happen. But I think about it, if I don't see a pancreatic duct and I have a mass that's big enough in a spot like the head or neck that should be obstructing the duct, then I begin to think about other possibilities. So I like to think about things logically. If I have a reasonable size mass, I should have duct dilatation, common and or pancreatic, depending where the lesion is sitting. So I've said this in many lectures, if you have a big mass that seems to be head of pancreas, and there's no pancreatic duct or common duct dilatation, it's probably not going to be an adenocarcinoma. So that can be very, very helpful. Now, another thing that I think is challenging is what about pancreatitis? Now, if you know the patient has pancreatitis, that's kind of easy, but sometimes it's not clear. And remember, a lot of the earlier articles spoke about the concurrent presence of pancreatic cancer and pancreatitis. And people talk about that happening in up to 5% of cases. So it is something that perhaps you should be thinking about. Now, I think what happens is in a patient with pancreatitis, it's very easy perhaps to assume there isn't a tumor present or maybe the reverse, assume there is a tumor present. So you wanna be careful. If it looks like pancreatitis and you're borderline not certain, what I would recommend you do is simply um, maybe get a follow-up scan you don't want to take a patient to surgery and there not be a mass present. So you really want to be certain. Now, there are some things in that pancreatitis category that can be particularly tricky. We, we talk about autoimmune pancreatitis. Many patients with autoimmune pancreatitis end up going to surgery. Remember, autoimmune pancreatitis tends to look different 
the gland, often the entire gland is involved. It's enlarged, it's edematous, and you have a halo around it, sort of the cigar sign. We often can see um, autoimmune pancreatitis more focal, but again, it looks different, and typically there's no dilated duct present. Now remember, from a clinical perspective, autoimmune pancreatitis and cancer look the same. Same age group often, CA-19-9 is elevated, patient has symptoms of weight loss, patients could be jaundice. One thing also help, helpful with autoimmune pancreatitis is often multi-organ involvement. If you see decreased attenuation in the kidneys, your diagnosis is made. If you're thinking about autoimmune pancreatitis, speak up. They get a lab value, you test for IG4, it's elevated, give the patient two weeks of steroids, 40 milligrams a day, boom, you cure the patient. I saw the most unbelievable case yesterday, something pancreatic cancer, about um, three weeks ago, we said this is autoimmune pancreatitis, uh, patient was treated and now the pancreas is normal in size, patient had autoimmune pancreatitis, the pancreatic gland decreased in size by about half. So that's something to think about. The other one that can look really funny, and Brooke Jeffrey wrote some articles about this, is groove pancreatitis. It sits by the head and makes the head look big, and it can obstruct the duct, but think about the C-loop, you see these lobulations along the border, and that's groove pancreatitis because it's very groovy. You know, it happens in the groove. And so that's something also to think about. Again, that can be tricky on EUS because often the cells look inflammatory. So it is something that you need to think about. Now, another thing that you need to think about is, of course, you think about, again, let's go back to that duodenum. Uh, you have duodenum, you have pancreatic head. But what about the duodenum? So there are many things in the duodenum that can simulate pancreatic masses. So one I've spoken about are GIST tumors. GIST tumors commonly occur in the duodenum. They're often large. They're homogeneous. Now, the thing about the big GIST tumors, they don't obstruct. They're typically not hypervascular. The key thing is when you have something this big and it's not obstructing the common pancreatic duct and it's so homogeneous, you better be thinking about a GIST tumor. So I've seen a whole bunch of GIST tumors there. Every once in a while, you can see smaller GIST tumors under 3CM, more like 2CM, that are hypervascular. And then perhaps your biggest problem is separating them from carcinoid tumors or separating them perhaps when they're medially located from a mass off the uh, head of the pancreas, like a neuroendocrine tumor. Which kind of brings me to neuroendocrine tumors or carcinoid tumors. Now, typically, you can separate a typical neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreatic head from the duodenum. It's clear cut. But sometimes you have neuroendocrine tumors arising off the duodenum simulating a pancreatic mass. I've showed a few cases in conference. I've showed sometimes on CTSS you've seen a case. It's just really hard because they seem to abut each other, and you can, can't tell is it going from duodenum to a pancreas or pancreas to duodenum. Or maybe it's like one of those Zollinger Ellison syndromes where it's a vascular lesion between the duodenum and the pancreatic head, you know, in that. Uh, ZE triangle, perhaps. I think what happens sometimes is you need to be look very, very carefully. The reconstructions, coronal, sagittals, the multiplanars can all be helpful. We're looking at some role of cinematic. I think sometimes you may have a hard time, and then either you biopsy or it's going to be removed the surgery, and the surgery will end up being the same. But it can be a challenge. Another thing that I've seen challenging at times is if you have an adenal carcinoma with the duodenum, particularly in the second portion. It can obstruct the patient's uh, common duct. And then it looks like a pan it looks like a pancreatic cancer. So ampullary cancer, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, duodenal adenocarcinoma, when they occur in that strategic location can be very difficult to distinguish. The good news is the surgery is Whipple's procedure for all three of them, and then the pathologist will tell you the answer. But I hate to wait for the pathologist to tell me an answer. We need to answer um, the question ourselves. And so that can be very valuable. Then the other thing to mention is, remember, the pancreas sits around a really good nodal bed. So I've mentioned we can see nodes in the region. We've seen esophageal cancer and gastric cancer metastasized there. Most commonly, we think about right colon cancer. Not often, always with the primary tumor in the right colon, patient may have had a right hemicolectomy and now recurrences in the peripancreatic region. So you can see large nodes in the peripancreatic region simulating a pancreatic mass. We've seen this also with melanoma. And as long as I mentioned melanoma, I should mention that melanoma can metastasize with the pancreatic bed into the duodenum 
and can really simulate a tumor of the pancreas. So that's something also very good to think about. Now, um, when you think about the tail of the pancreas, I focus mainly on the head. The biggest problems there, the mimickers are splenules. Remember we say usually splenules are splenic hilum, they're away from the tail of the pancreas, very easy to separate. But sometimes they abut and sometimes splenules can be inside the pancreatic tail. And it's really tricky in that regard. What we do is we look at the enhancement pattern. Splenules enhance like the spleen. If you have a neuroendocrine tumor, it's more vascular than the spleen and the enhancement is different both early and late. It can be tricky if you're still not sure Tag red blood cell study can be done. Um, we don't want someone going to surgery for no reason. We don't want surgery for splenule. Most of the time, really easy. Every once in a while, it can indeed be more challenging. Also for the tail of pancreas, I should mention, sometimes large tumors near the tail, whether it's an exophytic gist tumor, or it's a mass from near the adrenal, or it's retroperitoneal, every once in a while, it can be difficult to separate a mass particularly if it's large from a pancreatic mass. Sometimes the epicenter is really goofy. It's just a whole bunch of things sitting together, spleen, tail of pancreas, stomach, adrenal, maybe right kidney, I mean left kidney. So it can be kind of challenging. So in some sense, you wanna be very careful. I don't think those cases are that difficult if you pay attention and you don't make mistakes. So when I was writing or starting to write this lecture, I kind of put down things that are useful imaging features to prevent errors. I put down, look at the pancreatic duct, look at the common duct, look at the key vascular structures, be it the arterial side, celiac SMA, GDA, or the venous side, portal vein, splenic vein, SMV. Look at attenuation of the mass. Remember, pancreatic adenocarcinoma carcinoma is low density, neuroendocrine tumors are very vascular. And again, remember that the things we think about, is it duodenum, is it near the duodenum? Could it be nodes? Is it in the pancreas or is it outside the pancreas? What exactly are you dealing with are all questions. And again, the presence of adenopathy can be somewhat tricky as well. So I've covered all of those things. Um, again, a challenge, I'll go back again, be it head, body, or tail, is focal pancreatitis. If you have focal pancreatitis with no history of pancreatitis, it can be difficult to simply blow it off versus saying this is a tumor. So you can have false positives or false negatives if you're not very careful. I mentioned splenules, you can do a tag red blood cell study. Sometimes if you're really uncertain, you may recommend EUS or ERCP. MRCP can be helpful in select cases, as can MR. PET-CT occasionally can be helpful. And of course, you know, if we only have imaging studies, if you have a question, EUS can be very valuable and at times biopsy are gonna be necessary. So there is um, a really good thing that you can consider. Now, I should look at questions. Nasha Beller Siva, is perfusion CT a useful tool for adenocarcinoma versus autoimmune pancreatitis? Um, I think when you do dual phase imaging, it's that the difference in arterial and venous, often in both phases of enhancement, because the glian looks boggy and you see that the rim around the grand, the low density. I had the greatest case today, incredible. And that brings up the point, I saw it also on cinematic. The cinematic with the texture mapping may prove to be very valuable. Uh, Satomi Kawamoto, Linda Chu have done work on autoimmune pancreatitis and looking at uh, whether radiomics can separate. And their results that radiomics is about 100% successful, the best radiologist in the low 70% range. That article, I think, is either accepted or it's being submitted, uh, resubmitted. Uh, so again, I think we're going to get much better at making that differentiation. But at times, it can be a challenge. Most of the time, I have no issue. But every once in a while, I remember there's lots of series where there are a lot of surgical patients who had autoimmune pancreatitis. The good news is most of those were in the past, but I've seen it in the present as well. So thanks for the question. If anyone has any more questions, we're kind of uh, running out of time. I think if you look at CT as us, one of the things we have are really good apps. There's three apps on the pancreas at the Apple Store. One's a checklist, one's a compendium, compendium of everything that exists on the pancreas. And one is something else which I can't remember. Well, what, there's stuff in the pearls, there's a bunch of stuff in the lectures, lots of stuff online. CT is us, the website, 
mass of thousands and thousands of cases, lectures, and everything else. So I think you can get a lot of good information going there. So let me conclude. If no one has any other questions, again, if you have questions, now's the time to raise your hand. Um, some of my conclusions, not everything that looks like pancreatic cancer is pancreatic cancer. Careful analysis of the data sets using a combination of multiplanar 3D axials, perhaps radiomics, perhaps in the future AI, will allow for the correct diagnosis to be made specifically in most cases. Remember I mentioned with autoimmune pancreatitis, we've gone from 70% to 100% now. And you will not always be correct. Sometimes the surgeon will be correct. Um, sometimes you can't say if it's a tumor or it's inflammation and you're just not sure and you don't know what to do. Um, again, EUS, biopsy, things you need to do. You'd like to not have a patient go to surgery and, this, and the pathology be normal. So that's what you're trying to avoid. And then Andreas Rocco, last thing, ask what the name of the app is. The name of the app, it has pancreas in the name. Just go to the Apple Store, use my name or use CTSS. You'll see 16 apps. There's, there's three of them that have the word pancreas in them. There's other apps like the lecture series that has a bunch of pancreatic lectures. There's the thing on pearls, which has a ton of pearls on pancreas. So there's lots and lots of stuff. And I thank you, Scott, for thanking me for this lunch and learn. Unfortunately, we did not provide you or me with lunch. So now you're on your own. Have a great day and see you on CTSS. Take care. Bye.